So uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the monitoring and uh, a little bit about how to improve. So why to recruit? Um, I, I, despite all the damage caused by the art trial, uh, and I think the disappointment with this study, I still believe that uh, this meta-analysis is not far from reality, so there is this equipoise in terms of the benefits. And, and I think if we add now what we have learned, maybe there is still room for improvement and new research on this topic. So uh, is this still equipoise? So which is the image we have in mind? What is a high recruitability? Is an animal like this or a patient like this? And uh, typically we like to do recruiting maneuvers with fixed delta pressure. This is proven already that this decreases the ch chances of uh, barotrauma trauma or ventilator induced lung injury. And this is a patient that, uh, for instance, there is no recruitability because it's already recruited or could be a fixed consolidation that cannot be recruited. Um, so this is what we have in mind. And now there is some research in terms of, OK, can, can we know upfront if uh, this patient is recruitable or not? And more or less, this was the original intention of this multicenter physiological study. But uh, we had also some other outcomes that are very interesting to, to show here. So there were, uh, the, the whole protocol was something like this. Uh, we have the clinical PEEP, and then we decreased PEEP, increased to 16. Here, we measure the recruitment to inflation ratio, as proposed by Laurent Brochard and Lu Chen. And then we also did a recruitment maneuver in some patients up to 24 and some other patients to 30. Later on, I'm going to comment on this. And then 30 of PEEP, but then you have 15 of delta pressure, which means that you reach 45. So maximum pressure, 45. And then we had the decremental PEEP steps. So uh, how did you assess in this study uh, the recruitability? I'm going to talk about the COSTA method, which is a method that uh, we use most of the times when we use electrical impedance tomography. And multiple brains, uh, brands of EIT now use this method. The COSTA method is very nice for two reasons. First is that you can clearly identify the, let's say, the proposal uh, for, uh, it's very clear to detect what, which, which should be the, let's say, ideal PIP. So you have the calculation of collapse, you have the calculation of over distension, and then the crossing point is very interesting because now lots of recent studies have shown that this point coincides with a transpulmonary pressure slightly positive. So it's exactly the transpulmonary pressure that you you have in your lung when seated in this room. So uh, this is the transpulmonary pressure that all the mammals they like. And the normal physiology of mammals is typically trying to, to set a transpulmonary pressure of, of, of between zero and two. It's, where your, it's when your airways are open and you don't have too much collapse and not also over distension. This method is also very good because we did validation studies comparing CT and EIT and the coincidence is very large. And in fact, the COSTA method was planned to be, a let's say, a, a good correlate or a good surrogate of CT collapse. And this is a validation study showing that the correlation between CT and EIT is very nice. Something interesting, just for you to understand the principles also. So this is a patient supine and trained Allenburg. You see the crossing point here is at 11, and when I have the trained Allenburg, the crossing point goes to 16. Why? Because now the pleural pressure is more positive, and then I need a higher PEEP to overcome this. If I had an esophageal balloon, I would come to exactly the same conclusion. Another example, if I put some weight on top of the peak, this was the curves before the weight, so this animal would be very fine with a PEEP of 5, but after the weight, there is a 
complete shift of all the curves to the left, and now this animal is going to be fine with 14 after putting some weight. So this is a model of obesity. Uh, and the obese patients, they behave exactly in this way. Okay, using this method, applied in this big population of 100 patients, 107 patients with COVID, we got this result. So this is the number of patients, and this is the, let's say, how much of the parenchyma could be recruited at those pressures that I showed you before. Plateau pressure of 45. So as you, and then we divided in three ter tertios, tertios. So we have the, the high recruiters, medium and low. If we compare this result with previous studies, in black, you have the famous study from Gattinoni that was published in the New England Journal, where he showed that the average or median value for recruitability is 13%, which means that only one-tenth of your parenchyma can be recruited. So it's very questionable with this very low number if it's worth it. Then we had the study of Proti that with the same technique, he found a more optimistic value, 25%, and the distribution is much more to, to the right, so it means that some patients, they reach 50%, so half of the parenchyma was closed, and after the maneuver was open. And now for the COVID patients, we got an even higher value, so 32, so one third of the lung was not working, and after the maneuver was working. So it's a much more optimistic result. This was one of the results of the study. Another interesting uh, result was that, so low, mid, and high recruitability, and let's see the crossing point. Here it was 10, and for the high recruiters, 16. So this uh, graph suggests that the patients presenting more recruitability, they need higher PEEP. A small suggestion, but uh, the reality is not like this. I'm going to show you why. So obviously these patients, they present a big overdistension if you use the wrong PEEP and a, a high PEEP, while these patients, they present very little overdistension if you achieve, for instance, 24 of PEEP. But uh, this is what uh, I told you, that uh, the reality is not like this, because this is low, mid, and high recruiters. Look, these dots is the crossing point of each patient, so, which means that the, this is the PEEP causing slightly positive transpulmonary pressure. And look at this, there is a big overlap. So, which means that if you are a big recruiter, doesn't mean that you need a high PEEP. This is very important clinical conclusion. For instance, some patients here, they needed just 10 of PEEP to recruit more than one third of the parenchyma. This is very interesting. Again, plotting these points, uh, this is body mass index. This is the crossing point. So this is the ideal PEEP, the physiological PEEP that we mammals, we love. It's much more than we are used to think about. This is post-operative patients, so they have normal lungs. So there is a striking correlation with body mass index, which means that we should be using more PEEP in obese patients. And this is COVID patients. And the interesting thing is that they're almost the same. I was very surprised about this result because this means something that I never imagined before, that the PEEP the, let's say your need for PEEP is much more an anatomical issue, individual shape of the thorax, than the lung weight. This was very interesting because the lung weight is responsible for a difference of two centimeters of water. And I have confirmed this in animals also. So PEEP is an anatomical issue, it's a property of your body, shape of the body. Um, if you increase your body mass index by three, you need one centimeter more of PEEP. So then, um, just also something that was uh, correlated with these results. We, previously, we did some studies of recruitment maneuvers in obese patients in Boston, because they have the super obese patients. 
Uh, and, um, and then um, in, if we had the super obese and based on these data that uh, the pleural pressure is correlated with obesity and the need for PEEP the same way. So then for the big, very obese patients, the highest pressure was 50, not 45. And then also we started titration in some of these patients at 30 of PEEP because some of them, the crossing point was at 26, 28 of PEEP. And we put an esophageal balloon, transpulmonary pressure zero. Uh, when we, we applied this PEEP in, in, in super obese patients, so the average PEEP was 22, average. Uh, there was an interesting result, especially in, this is a graph of overdistension, and this is collapse. You have it, always three situations, baseline, PEEP, and after the recruit maneuver, recruiting maneuver. This, this two, these two situations is the same PEEP. The interesting thing is that, as expected, we reduced the amount of collapse, but also we reduced the amount of overdistension. This was very reinforcing. The driving pressure dropped by almost 10 centimeters of water. So this was very, uh, I, I, let's say, I, it's a very promising result. And also something very, that was very interesting, it's good to know this at the bedside, is that if you have high pleural pressure, you are protected against hemodynamic problems. Uh, in this study, we measured transmural right ventricular pressure and transmural left ventricular pressure. This is before and after the recruitment. You can see that if the animal is thin, skinny animals, after the recruiting maneuver, you increase the afterload for the right ventricle. And, uh, okay, left ventricle, you have a decreased afterload because now you have a big pressure surrounding the left ventricle. But if you are obese, look at this. The transmural afterload of the right ventricle is completely is improved. So you decrease the afterload to the right ventricle. So for this patient, Recruiting is a relief for the heart. And we have seen some patients that after the recruitment, I could remove completely norepinephrine. Also something that is very interesting after, uh, about the COSTA method is, is, is this. So if I split the population now, not, -inter, not intersiles, but uh, just a half in the medium value, which means that I have recruiters and non-recruiters. So high recruiters and low recruiters. And then how much I, 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 I can reduce driving pressure after the, the recruitment? A lot. And you see some patients, they, have a, they had a reduction of almost 10 centimeters of water in terms of driving pressure, which is a lot. But the nice thing about the COSTA method is that for every single patient, you are doing, you, you are not, the benefit here is moderate, but you are not causing any harm. Any, you are not causing any increase in driving pressure. And uh, when we did with the, in the ART trial, just for your reference, one third of the patients, they had increased driving pressure after the maneuver, which means that uh, we did very poorly. And so I think we need better technology to do this. Okay, this is why I think I believe that this method is much better. And again, if you are more obese, body mass index increases, you can reduce further the driving pressure. So these maneuvers are especially helpful for obese patients and high body mass index. Okay. Um, I um, almost at the limit of my time, so I'm going to finish a little bit about talking a little bit about how to identify those patients at the bedside. This is typically uh, a patient in which the image on EIT is like this. So if you make a line here, you are going to see that you have much more ventilation in the ventral part than in the dorsal part. And this is the image for this patient. So this image now, after tons of data, is almost uh, the diagnostic of dorsal atelectasis. And this is very useful at the bedside because if you see a patient like this in which you have less than 40% ventilation, 
this is a signal that this patient maybe should be submitted to a recruiting maneuver. And if you are not successful and you cannot increase this value above at least to 50%, this is a patient that has to go to prone positioning or some lateral positioning. We have some data to show about this and we are going to show in the late afternoon. But this is a strong signal that uh, this patient has dorsal atelectasis. And in fact, we are now working with this let's say, uh, morphological characteristic of the patients in the EIT. And we can see that whenever we have some quadrant in the dorsal part that is compromised, so these three patients are patients that are potentially good for a recruiting maneuver or a positional change. And these patients typically have a worse oxygenation. So the message here is that we need better identification of the patients to be recruited, and then we need better technology to assess how to treat and how much pressure we need for each patient. Thank you very much.